Hello everyone and welcome to Community Gardens and Food Waste. My name is Benjamin John. I'm the Climate Change and Energy Specialist for the Georgian Bay Biosphere. Thank you very much for joining us on this webinar today and we're really just going to jump right in. Um, at this point I imagine most of us have participated in either a Zoom meeting or a webinar, Zoom webinar, uh, but just in case I just want to point out uh, some of the features that are available to us. So you should see at the bottom a Q&A tool. If you have a question at any time in during the webinar, uh, please put it in there and we will answer questions as well at the end of the presentation. Um, we have a few polls set up for today um, and they look like this. So feel free to take uh, 30 seconds or so to put your answer into the poll. And here are the results. So also note that uh, we will be recording today's session and uploading it on our YouTube channel. Um, a link to the video and other resources mentioned in today's presentation will be circulated. We're going to turn off our cameras during the presentation, so please don't worry if you can't see us. Um, but as we wait for a few more people to join, I do want to share a little bit about uh, the Georgian Bay Biosphere Reserve. We're one of 18 UNESCO World Biospheres here in Canada. Our region is ecologically unique with the largest freshwater archipelago on Earth. Uh, this biosphere in particular, it stretches 200 kilometers from the Severn River to the French River, and it was designated back in 2004. We are a registered charity with an office in Parry Sound, and we rely on grants, partnerships, and donations to do our conservation and education work. We'd also like to acknowledge the, the land before we begin. The Georgian Bay Biosphere is situated within the treaty territories of Huron-Robinson of 1850 and the Williams Treaty of 1920, and located on Anishinaabek territory. Our organization under UNESCO acknowledges the rights of Indigenous peoples in this territory and work towards respectful and reciprocal relationships as we are all caretakers of the land. Uh, but with that, I will now turn things over to our first presenter, Glenda Clayton, uh, Community Inclusion and Support Facilitator with Community Living Perry Sound. Good morning and thank you for joining us. And yes, I also get to wear the hat of being the co-coordinator of the Community Gardens in Perry Sound. So fabulous day, so thanks for joining us. I suspect if you're interested in community gardens, you're already probably a bit of a gardener yourself. You perhaps have a pot of herbs on a deck, a pot of tomatoes, something like that. Or perhaps you have a huge garden space and you're producing most of your own food needs. And there's so many good reasons, of course, to do that. You've experienced the joy of nurturing a plant and harvesting food for yourself, preparing a meal, um, I sometimes joke about my meals being sort of the 20 steps from the garden to the kitchen diet, which is fantastic. And just a, a little story from yesterday. Yeah, the gardening, I was at one of our community gardens picking up donated produce, and there was a mother and a young child playing on a, it's a public park, so they're playing on a play set. And as soon as we open to the gate to the garden, because our gates are fortunately locked at this point because of COVID and we have to restrict access, but the little girl was immediately drawn into the garden and it was just, you know, sure, come in and we kept our, our physical distance. But watching that little girl and her mom go through the garden with mom identifying some of the plants and you know for that little girl, that experience of touching kale and things like that is gonna help her be, uh, you know, just probably more likely to try some of these vegetables in the future. And the other fun little thing about that was the mother asked about, garden plot for next year and so we're able to connect her with a garden plot so the, the joys of gardening as i say if you're on this call you probably already know that uh, i i joke about gardening being a grounding experience some people think of it as a sort of meditation it's a way to sort of connect with nature it's physical exercise it's healthy diets it's increasing food security for for your own home and the way our program works, it also helps 
it's the food share idea. We also share with the local food programs. So I think it was no surprise in some ways this spring when COVID restrictions came on, all of a sudden there was a huge interest in gardening. So I've got to say, if you're going to promote a community garden now in your area, your timing is perfect because everyone wanted seeds in the spring. And now it's hard to find like mason jars because now people are processing some of the food that they've produced. And uh, so the, the idea of food security, the concerns about food security really came to the forefront to people's thoughts this spring with COVID as we looked at borders and transportation systems perhaps changing. And then look at the situation now, California and the fires and the Gulf states, Florida and such, back-to-back -back hurricanes, again, fortune, it's brought, but the only fortunate, like wrong choice of words there, it's brought climate change really to the, also to the forefront for people's thoughts. So even you think of what it has in Ontario here, so much of our produce is coming from places like California and Florida. So again, the timing is right for people to really think about how we can produce more food in our own backyards. Um, also this spring, community gardens, the province declared them essential, so we were allowed to have access with changes of how we operated with the community gardens, but they were deemed an essential service. So the community gardens throughout the province were allowed to open and people were able to go to those. Um, and if you're interested in, you know, cross fingers that we're not in the situation next spring, but the health unit was definitely helpful in providing the protocols to allow us to operate the community gardens safely. So let's get next 15 minutes. I want to share a wee bit about our experiences here, setting up community gardens in Perry Sound, and then of course we'll welcome your questions. So, um, what are community gardens? And just, I'm gonna get rid of my poll results so I can see better. There, thank you. Um, what are community gardens? Obviously, and the name says, it's a shared space where people can come together to garden. And what can that look like? It depends on, on your gardens. In our area, what we chose was the concept of everyone would have an allotment, their own plot. So three by four meter size, and you would be assigned a plot and that would be yours to garden throughout the season. Part of that would be having an agreement with the gardener that they would uh, you know, agree to garden organically, agree to keep their garden relatively weed free and things like that. So those agreements are, are key when you're setting up your garden. Another uh, type of community gardens, and I know some church groups that do this, is you have a space that people will come and the whole space is one large garden and people garden it collectively and they may divide the proceeds amongst themselves or in some cases, they donate 100% of what they grow to a local food bank. I'm aware of some of those, especially in southwestern Ontario. So different, um, different types of community gardens. With ours, um, we don't charge a, a cash rent. Um, some do, and that's a way of helping fund the garden. But what we do ask is people consider donating 20% of what they grow to a local food program. So that might be Harvest Share, which we'll clear, so we'll be speaking about shortly, Salvation Army Food Bank, the Perry Sound um, Esprit's Place, a women's shelter, the Friendship Center. So places like that, uh, the produce is donated to different organizations. And my computer is not moving my next slide forward. Interesting. But, oh, there we do. Uh, so who, thank you. <laughs> I just gave Delena a little scare. I like that look on her face, just making sure. So who, judging interest, obviously, First part of community gardens, and you know, again, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to put the order in there. Some people, you know, it's like, bring your committee together first. Who will be the people taking the lead? Other, and it kind of makes sense to me, is have a feel for your community. Who might be the people that want to garden there? And reaching out to them, it could be through a municipal newsletter, it could be through local service clubs, could be through the school, it could be through um, going and doing, presentations ideally at association meetings, be it a Zoom presentation or whatever. It might be even, yeah, um, just putting up some posters in town to gauge interest. And those lead, having a coordinator 
is essential. Um, the gardens, once they get up and running, there's still ongoing communication with gardeners. There's applying to funding applications. There's ensuring maintenance and things are done. We were really fortunate, I think, at the beginning for, for us, for Perry Sound, it was that um, we had an organization here, like the Georgian Nebraska Reserve, a mandate of sustainable communities. And we had George, uh, Community Living Perry Sounds, Community Living Perry Sound connecting people with developmental disabilities in the community. We had the health unit on board early and very helpful in terms of funding and guidance and resources for putting up signs and things like that. And so when you build that committee, think about the organizations that are the natural fit in your locality. So, you know, for example, Horticultural Club would come to mind for sure, reaching out, as I say, to the health unit. Having a not-for-profit organization is very helpful or a charitable organization because that opens up a window of different funding opportunities. Um, having, if a school was involved, having youth involved in some form, that also op opens up the opportunities for different funds as well. Um, the thing about having a nice committee with a few diverse groups is, that, again, at the beginning, there's quite a bit of workload that you can apply for different funding sources. So for instance, with Community Living Perry Sound as a partner, uh, we've been able to su supply a summer student for perhaps the last eight years, and that summer student helps out with essential maintenance of the gardens, cutting grass, weed eating, and things like that, and uh, so, you know, watering, all those, or ensuring that water is, is there and things like that. So that's all been very helpful. So I encourage you to really think of those natural partners in your community you might reach out to to help form your key committee. So in our case, our committee now really, um, I act as a coordinator, the Biosphere Reserve co-coordinates the gardens as well, and uh, we answer or talk with, of course, our own boards of our various agency, Community Living and Georgia Mead Biosphere Reserve, but we also share all the community garden messages with the Perry Sound and Area Local Food Collaborative, so we can have the guidance and support from those both those organizations or three organizations um, in terms of in a perfect world as i say you might have a paid employee like a summer student that could be involved in helping with the basic maintenance i'm very fortunate because my position at community living allows me to help coordinate the gardens as well but also volunteers are wonderful and we've had a regular volunteer probably since the garden has started he uh he helps out three times a week through the active season with everything from like rototilling in the spring to helping collect the produce and such himself. And, and the nice thing is he is a person that would also potentially use some of the food share programs that he, be he benefits from, but he then contributes by helping out with the community gardens. So find yourself, find what the interest is in your community, find who your lead people are going to be and lead organizations. And in a perfect world, if you can at least find a paid employee to devote some time to the gardens, that's fantastic. I mean, obviously it depends upon some scale. If you're doing with one small garden, it's fine for volunteers. But as you expand, like at Perry Sound, we now have six gardens and so 70, 80 plots. So where? Choose well. Um, obviously, permission it seems funny having to put that in, but you almost want to start with thinking about where are you likely to be able to enter into a good long term agreement to have access to that land space. Uh, we were fortunate, uh, District Social Services was the location for one of our first gardens and sort of a, almost an abandoned space that had been previously used as a ball field next to a daycare center. So we have our garden, first garden was located there. Um, and we have a long-term agreement for that garden space because you're going to be investing likely in things like fencing, um, sheds, things like that. So if you're going to put the effort into baking the garden, it's nice to know that it's going to be there for a, a long time. The obvious next other places to look would be things like public parks um, because there's always that, there's already that, you know, that, that ability to have public access. Uh, Canador College, you saw my first slide. That's again, a fairly natural because it's an open space. 
Um, we don't have any of our gardens located on, on what would be considered like a landowner or private property. Uh, Not-for-profit housing all, also offers space for one of our other gardens. So, you know, do take the time to think carefully about where you want to locate the garden and know that you're going to have long-term access and set up that memorandum of understanding and inquire about how that, that space is insured because you need to make sure you have liability insurance for that space. So then we get to go to the good stuff, as I'd say, like that's all the background necessary. You need a space that's gonna provide sun, six to eight hours of sun a day. So if you're looking about, you check out buildings. Our building's gonna shade the space that you're potentially thinking about because you really can't change that. Um, if there's a beautiful 100-year-old white pine, no one's going to look favorably upon you if you have to uh, trim out that pine in order to get sun on the space that you think is the perfect garden space. So sun is the, definitely the decide, one of the deciding factors. And then, to be honest, and I put these in the order of priority, water. Do you have access to water for the gardens? We are lucky at all our sites uh, through either a very cooperative local landowner or public water at the parks or Canador helping provide the water. We use hoses to fill barrels so the cold chlorinated water from Georgian Bay, because it's tall town water, gets a chance to dechlorinate and warm up so people can use that. So water, of course, is key. Uh, it's the only way you're gonna have a successful garden. This summer was a classic for that, how dry it was. So soil, put soil third. And of course, we're Perry Sound, so soil is sometimes hard to come by. And, uh, but you can always build with what you have. Our one, one of our last gardens was at the former school in town, which has now been turned into housing. And I laugh because the garden space there, the first time trying to dig it up, it's like it's about three inches of soil and feels like concrete because of course it's been packed down by decades of kids going back and forth into the school. But slowly and surely you can work on soil. You can bring in soil if you have funding for that or perhaps get a donation from a local contractor of some topsoil. You can work on compost and all those sorts of amendments. So. I do put sun first, water second, and soil, you can, you can help it over the years as you add to it. Obviously, how accessible will the site be? Is there parking nearby? Is there a bike rack? Or wherever you see people accessing that garden space, do they have a good, safe place to, to park, to be there? And security, it's an interesting thing to think of. We have one garden space where it came to my attention that some people didn't feel secure up there because they felt it was a little too isolated, not seen from the road and such. So you do want to balance that idea of how, perhaps how, how comfortable you think the average person is going to feel if they're choosing to garden there at seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night. Uh, obviously, animals. You will need a fence if you're gardening in anywhere in this along Eastern Georgian Bay. Deer love our gardens. Uh, deer unfortunately can jump seven, eight feet. Um, that's an expensive fence. So our, our compromise has always been about a five foot fence with an extended pole of which we just run either wire or fish line, uh, two lines of that because that creates the barrier for deer to not to want to, to jump into the gardens. And I'd like to say, knock on something here, we've been had a fairly good success rate as long as we maintain those upper lines on the garden. You're still gonna run into other pests. Um, you know, but those are all issues that can be dealt with along the way. So just to give you an idea a little bit about our community gardens, as I say, I mentioned six. Our first one uh, was down at Wabik and uh, sort of in this neck of the woods. But what I like is the idea of our gardens, when you look at that map, we have two in the north, two in the center, and two in the south. And really, all of Perry Sound, what's that? 10, 15 minutes between sites. And so I can have one person who actually has one plot up in a top garden, and then he also then goes down to a garden 10 minutes away on bike and, and maintains another plot there. So thinking about, again, it's that accessibility. Where are your gardens on, going to be located, how accessible they're going to be for people. And the how, that's also a, a very fun part. So, You've judged your, the interest in your community. You've got a line up of eager gardeners. You've got a committee together that are going to help coordinate those gardens. You have an individual that's gonna help be that responsible coordinator to manage communications with the gardeners, provide them updates, emails, Facebook, all those kind of things, newsletter, whatever format you want. 
um, you're going to provide those agreements that the gardener is going to agree to X, Y, Z. There's some really good examples of online of those. Um, the funding. Um, you're going to need some seed seed funding for those gardens to get up to get off the ground. There you go, two in a row. And uh, so good examples, TD Friends of the Environment, Home Depot have um, money to support things like this, different various municipalities. You might have local service clubs that would love to, to provide some seed funding for this kind of thing. But then also as you get going, we've hosted, with the exception of this year, an annual seedling sale where many of us will start plants and then join in on a horticultural plant sale to sell vegetable seedlings and that can raise $500, $600 easily there. We've run a series of workshops that from seed to table, a five month series where people meet once a week to learn about how to garden and how to harvest and all those things and that was a paid for series. So again, in relatively easy way to raise five or $600 to help support your gardens. And then reaching out. Who are the people that are willing literally to dig in and help start that garden? So bringing team together from your different organizations, reaching out to community members to, to build the gardens, um, setting up, uh, you can see that in the lower picture there, we decided with one garden that had been a little bit problems with drainage and stuff that we're going to all raise beds there. So combination of volunteers making those raised beds and getting them into place and those will be ready, ready to go next year. I did mention insurance early, but again, keep in mind that, um, you know, again, with public parks, municipal, the town insurance will cover you with our agreement with Canada or college. Uh, fortunately, the Georgian Bay Biosphere Reserves insurance was able to provide that coverage we needed in terms of liability. I do really encourage that as a committee, as a garden coordinator, whomever's taking that lead role, that you do have those sort of bi-weekly little email notes out to gardeners. It helps um, address any issues that you see as you visit the gardens and, uh, and puts the ability to solve those problems very early on in the season when you see them. And I really will go back to the We've really enjoyed the ability to have a summer student be part of this. We call that person a community cultivator so they can help provide that consistent feedback to the gardeners. They can help with identifying early on any issues. Um, and I, this is a fabulous resource. And I know sometimes you can sort of like, I could throw 10 or 20 different resources to you, but this is the one I would say go here and you can find everything else you need. Um, I wish this had been around when I started the community gardens, but even a beautiful, in the appendix, there's one that in a community, like if you're hosting your community meeting, it has an example agenda. It has a budget sheet for you. It has how to pr transport produce safely. Their lovely appendix D is a community garden checklist. So honestly, Anything in this presentation would be right there, like number one, is there any interest and enthusiasm in your community? Do you have a committee of volunteers? Do you have the appropriate leader? Blank, blank, blank. And basically it ends with, if you've checked off most of these boxes, you're good to go. You know, this is what you need. And I come back to what I said at the beginning, with COVID bringing this to the forefront of people's idea of food security, with climate change being very much in the news right now, people are concerned and your timing to initiate a community garden is perfect. It takes about six months. So you'll be ready to go for next spring by starting now, okay? Oh, I forgot to put that in. There's your garden checklist. And I do wanna say, and this is fantastic to have had this opportunity to share with you, um, gardening is contagious, the community gardens. So soon after about the fourth garden in Perry Sound happened, Shawana got put in a garden that does up the model that it's collectively gardened and then shared with the community. So not individual allotments, but a collective garden. And then Mary Street or St. James United Church, they put in raised beds and then a group of people maintain those gardens and provide food for one of the, the food share programs hosted by the church for lunches and such. And in conclusion, this is just one day's collection of the 20% donated produce 
that would be going that day, I know, to Harvest Share, where Clarissa will be talking shortly, where Clarissa works. So look at this lovely arrangement of, uh, okay, the evil zucchini is still in the middle there, but from tomatoes to beans to cucumbers to eggplant, and that's one day's donation, obviously in August when the produce is coming on beautifully. Our lovely summer student there who helped uh, from, you know, end of June to just shortly ago, she finished up. And, and there's my great volunteer who's been with us for like eight years, three days a week, going out to the gardens and helping out with any maintenance and such that's necessary. So the benefits of community garden as a way of connecting people to growing their own food is fantastic. The ability to be, for people to contribute to their community by giving back food to, to an organization like Harvest Share is fantastic. And if we can inspire more people to garden, uh, we know that we're doing our doing our part for helping reducing our our carbon footprint as well so thanks for an opportunity to share i suspect there'll be questions because i always probably miss something nice and obvious that i should have said but um welcome your questions thanks glenda i uh, really appreciate that um also really appreciate some of those puns in though in there those were were great um we do have a few questions we have a few minutes for questions so I'll start with the first one. Uh, what are some good vegetables that could grow in the Wabi garden with not as much watering? And I think it would be great if we can start with maybe that question specifically, um, but maybe if you can expand on that as well and maybe touch on a few vegetable species that uh, can grow with Perfect. not as much watering in general. Yeah. So, and I, I, I identify the issue for Wabi, I mean, A, classic carry sound, slightly sandier soil. B, we rely on the local daycare to fill the food barrels there. We don't have access to that, sorry, food, water barrels there. Um, so that makes it a little harder, the water barrels, to get them always filled up consistently. So heavy water users are things like tomatoes. Um, so, and, and again, they're a joy to have and they're a great uh, crop, but they are heavier. So there, there's some options. It's like looking at mulch. So very few gardeners, in my experience with Community Gardens Perry Sound, rely on mulch to help uh, preserve moisture. So that could be leaf mulch, that could be a straw mulch, ideally a relatively clean straw for that. But crops that will fare a bit better with less moisture, things like the beans can do reasonably well, um, I don't find thing well, garlic and onions can do without at least, uh, you know, as much moisture. But again, it's, it's really looking at trying to preserve what you have. So mulch can be your friend. Thanks, Glenda. Um, if there's any more questions, we welcome those into the chat into the question and answer uh, box, sorry. Give you a minute or so to type any of those out. All right, seeing no further questions, I'd like to now turn things over to our next presenter, Clarissa Kennedy, the program coordinator. Clarissa? Hello. All right, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Okay, well, I want to thank uh, the Biosphere for inviting me to be here today because I'm really excited to talk about our food rescue program and let people know exactly 
what we're doing at Harvest Share and uh, if they are interested in getting involved and in how our food programs are actually helping save the environment and affect climate change. I also want to say thank you, Glenda, for your excellent presentation and every week this summer from the community gardens we benefited from a huge amount of harvest huge zucchinis <laughs> at least twice a week and uh, it really is so incredible when you can share this fresh food with our community members it makes a real difference in their lives and their ability to access fresh and healthy nutritious food and actually that is, uh, you know, our mission statement is to increase access to healthy, nutritious food for people who are in need. And with our food rescue program, it actually allows us to also affect environmental protection by reducing the amount of greenhouse gases by rescuing food that would normally go into food waste. So this program has really been beneficial all around. So a little bit about um, environmental protection. In Canada, we know that food is grown, manufactured and produced, but actually through the supply chain, only 40% of this food gets used. The rest actually goes to waste and this costs about over $100 billion. Um, all this food goes into the landfill, which creates methane gas, which is the leading cause of climate change. So, what is food insecurity? And I thought it was just important to share this a little bit because uh, some people aren't really clear on the issue. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you don't have a job or you um, aren't doing everything you can to try and get food. It's just that your housing costs tend to be high, your income is low, and so you can't feed yourself and your family with healthy and nutritious food. We do actually know of a lot of people in our community who skip meals and also will get food for their kids but do without, and we are trying our best to rectify these issues. Um, the Perry Sound area, there's one in seven households are actually food insecure and uh, we know that actually only a quarter of those households will access a food program because of stigma and so what we're hoping this program will do is help reduce stigma because I think there's a lot of shame about people feeling the need to access food programs because they feel like maybe they're a failure and they can, can't provide for their family, but that's not the situation. We know rent is high. A lot of people have multiple jobs and still struggle to make ends meet with the cost of everything. And especially during this COVID uh, pandemic, a lot of people have experienced unemployment. And so we need to find ways to be able to feed more people fresh, healthy food without, uh, having to A, purchase it ourselves, and this food rescue program will do that for us. Um, okay. So if we look at like the kind of area, it's a huge area, and there is, you know, for that square kilometers, there's not that many people, but, the distance between where people are located and the hub of Perry Sound is always challenging. So one of the things we hope our food rescue program will do is allow us to share some of the food that we're rescuing with outlying food banks and be able to support them with the food that we're rescuing um, going forward. Uh, the other thing that's interesting to notice about our population is that seniors actually make up more than the youth and children in our community. And we know that the senior population is definitely in need. And we also know that they are the least likely to access our programs. And that tends to be because of, they feel like people might need it more than them. And we want everyone to know with this program, there is plenty of food for all. We get food every single day and it's actually, they are helping us and the environment by accessing our food programs. 
So we're working right now on outreach programs for seniors in order for them to be able to access this food uh, because they actually would be probably the best population to use it. As we know, this generation we're currently working with has been raised on mostly processed food and sometimes they lack the culinary skills of some of the cuts of meat and processing like culinary skills, I would say, basically in order how to prepare and cook these foods that we could then provide them with. So, as I said before, people often think that it's only um, unemployed people that access, but that's actually not the truth. Uh, we're a very seasonal town, so a lot of people work full time in the summer, but then they rely on EI during the winter, but it's almost impossible to save enough money to be able to access food for the long winters of Perry Sound. So this program uh, will allow them to get ahead instead of spending their savings. And that's kind of how we want to frame this program going forward is, you know, come access our program, get the fresh food you need in order to make a bunch of meals before you get to that point of desperation where you feel that uh, you have no choice. We want it to be like a pro-choice instead of an afterthought. Now we'll go into a little bit on food waste. So in Canada, the annual avoidable food loss is enough to feed every Canadian for five months, which is actually, you know, it really still amazes me that we produce more than enough food to feed everyone, yet people are hungry and don't have access to the food that they need to be healthy. This is uh, the organization we partner with is Second Harvest and foodrescue.ca and they did a bit of a research project on food waste across the supply chain and um, their research proved in Canada that we waste 11.2 million metric tons of food every single year unnecessarily and this chart outlines where the biggest waste of food problems occur. So Second Harvest actually developed a great way to interrupt the supply chain and in that provide this food to social service organizations in their area. And this program works fantastic in Toronto and Barrie. However, rural communities really struggle to be able to access this food. A lot of the time they don't have the capacity. So with that in mind, we decided to somewhat model their system, but do it completely different because a lot of the way that social service organizations would access this food would be digital. And uh, we have, well, I discovered that in our community, it's best to make connections, network, go and meet people, talk to them about it, and you know, do more of an informal process as well as do all the work to get organizations on board and show them that you're willing to step up and when you do that, it will benefit them as well. So the goals of our project, it's always important to start with some good goals. So we really wanted to increase the quantity and nutritional quality of the food available. Uh, we wanted to rescue food that we struggled to get as an organization, which was meat, meat, always meat. Like when Feed Ontario, we are our members of Feed Ontario, which is part of Food Banks Canada, would come up with, you know, an offer for meat. It was like we would have a celebration. And this was only probably maybe two years ago. And, you know, if the community donated a cow, it was a really like we couldn't believe the fortune good fortune we had to be able to share this with people and now i would say every monday wednesday and friday we average about 200 pounds of meat rescuing from no frills and all of this food we try to move on a regular basis to be able to help feed the community 
Um, another goal is to repackage food for distribution. This is uh, something we're still working on, a bit of a challenge, only because of our location and that we don't really have a kitchen in our location. So we get a lot of produce and sometimes, um, you know, we have to compost a lot of it because we just don't have the full resources and able to, you know, a lot of it will be, um, I would say preserved for community meal programs, but wouldn't be appropriate to hand um, to someone as grocery. So in that case, we want to make sure that uh, that food still gets used and we don't become far, part of the food waste problem. So we will also, if we get huge packages of apples, then we would individually package them so maybe each person gets like four and that way that food goes a lot further um let's see and partnering with local businesses and social agencies to make your program sustainable is key and and we learned that during the pandemic when we got in one day, I think, four calls to go and rescue food. And then we pretty much filled every single freezer of every restaurant that was closed in Perry Sound. So it's important to have those network and connections because they make your program happen and sustainable. And then the other important thing that we are still working towards is to educate people on how to store food, how to prepare food and uh, the nutritional benefits as well of you know reducing their consumption of processed food and trying to go to more fresh and frozen foods where are we now okay so ideas are great but you have to figure out how to put them into action so one of the things, the first thing we needed to look at was how much capacity do we have? What capacity do we need? And uh, how are we gonna get this fresh and frozen food from the agency to our organization? And then what do we do with it? So there was a huge part of recruiting volunteers and volunteers with pickup trucks because we definitely at times would show up and they would say, we have a little bit of stuff for you. And it was, you know, over 400 pounds. Uh, so a little to them is not always a little to us. So it's been a big learning curve, but with each rescue, we become better at what we do. And we will take coolers and ice packs to all our um, pickups. And that's really essential because you want to make sure that uh, with our food safety handlers, we want to keep things at the correct temperatures so that we can share them with the community. The other thing we needed to do was to create a FIFO system. My background is in restaurants, so it actually worked out well because it's kind of first in, first out. The product we get moves through our coolers and freezer system so that whatever comes in first goes out, um, you know, is stored properly, processed, and then we're not holding on to food for longer than we need to. Um, and again, to create the informal relationships with local businesses, that was me first heading out to tell people what we were trying to do and hopefully get them excited about partnering with us. And then I actually partnered with Food Rescue um, in Toronto. They had a mobile representative and his name was Dan and he came up and then he kind of introduced the program to them, which really legitimized, I think, what we were trying to do. It's not that it wasn't legit in the first place, but... But, uh, but he had been trying to call and contact these people for a while. But, you know, during the summer when it's our busiest season, so that was a bad idea. But these are things that they're learning about too. And, uh, and exciting that we're actually going to help guide some of the rural programs that they're doing and expanding out east. Um, so it's pretty exciting that what we have done has created such a big change here that it will also affect big change in other provinces in Ontario. And the other most important part is to make sure we're educating people in community on the best uh, before dates and what that actually means. 
So these are some pictures of our organization. And uh, the most important thing is to have freezers. Freezers, frozen food can help your food last for a lot longer than it normally would. Um, it can expand life up to six months, up to some year, up to a year for some products. This is another one of our room. Again, these are all freezers except for the one in the middle is a fridge. And uh, we have a system in place uh, that's you know not labeled, but because of COVID, we were very lucky to be able to hire a food bank, basically program coordinator specifically, who deals with the allocation of where food goes and how it is processed and which freezer we take from when we're preparing orders for individuals. And we have, as you can see, there's like a little food donation and consumption timetable that just keeps, we have those actually posted all over so that people know how long a uh, product can be kept and uh, when it needs to be either composted or if we need to share it immediately with another organization. So this is one of our food rescue bags and uh, this was provided to us by foodrescue.ca. We now have more coolers that we are using and um, we're actually really fortunate to live in a very cold place. <laughs> So when we do food rescues in the winter, uh, we often take it actually right out of the freezer and put it in the truck. And in being in a small town, it's pretty great that it stays temperature safe while we um, move it from location to location. And once it does arrive at our location, we very quickly weigh, process, and uh, store all the food to make sure it's time and temperature safe. So if you can look at this picture, there's a little uh, scale there, and it's probably my best find on Amazon. It will actually weigh up to 250 pounds, so you can stack banana boxes of meat on it, and it lasts, which is wonderful because it's super small and easy, and we transport that all over our office. That's how excited I was with that because it really is, it's like a little suitcase and um, it allows us to weigh every single thing we get in from every single supplier, which is essential because then we enter that data into the foodrescue.ca platform. So this is an example of some of our fridges and freezers. In the one we have eggs, um, and in this other fridge freezer, we have Starbucks Rescue, Sobeys Bread, and Tim Hortons. And if you look in the front, you can kind of see where we have broken down um, and repackaged, repurposed, uh, either stuff that came from community gardens or stuff that we purchased ourselves with our fresh food program to share with individuals. Here is a little bit closer up look. So if you see all that one side of the freezer door is all individual sandwiches rescued from Starbucks. So these are amazing for individuals who may not have the culinary skills to prepare a meal for themselves. And I mean, it's Starbucks sandwiches, which is pretty fantastic that we have the opportunity to share these with people who may not even be able to afford those in the first place. Um, we also rescue, so we do a rescue for Starbucks every Monday and every Thursday. We do a rescue from Tim Hortons every, we do ours on Wednesday, Salvation Army picks up on Monday. And uh, all that bread right there from Sobeys, we pick up on Monday and Monday and Wednesday and Salvation Army picks up on, I think, Friday. So we definitely needed Salvation Army as a partner in this to make it sustainable because we wanted to make sure that when we started this we would be able to it's easier for organizations to have a routine so they need to know every Monday Wednesday Friday we're gonna pick up and so if somebody doesn't pick up and that throws off the system then they may think the next week oh maybe they didn't really need it if they didn't pick up so 
at the beginning of the pilot project, we really had to be on track. And so if Salvation Army couldn't pick up, I would make sure we went picked up and shared that with other community resources. And here is an example of one of our 11 freezers. Now probably about five, I would say five to six, have are full of meat like this. And so this would be maybe I would say one food rescue. And this is, I mean, we have butcher steaks, we have veal, we have seafood, we get everything. And all of this meat would have gone into landfill and been disposed of. And now all of this meat goes regularly to feed our community, which is so exciting. And uh, probably one of the things we are most proud of. Uh, this is another example of one of our freezers and some of the Sobeys bread. Sobeys actually bakes extra bread uh, so that they can make sure they can provide us and Salvation Army with enough to feed the community. And in the little banana box there is some bagels from Tim Hortons. So always plenty of bread. We're pretty much able to give at least two loaves to everyone as well as enough meat for seven days so um, it really is very exciting what this program how this program has increased our capacity to be able to help people in need in our community so I think it's really important to recognize some of our food rescue partners and so no frills uh, was really the first to jump on board with oh I got excited there um, with the meat and produce and this summer lots of corn and salads uh so it's really it's really just incredible laura who works there uh we go there every monday wednesday friday she has ever she's pulled all the meat that is their sell before date not their best like not their expiry date and she stores it in the freezer back there and so we roll a trolley, it's all like ready for us in the freezer. We pick it up and it, we take, bring it back to the office to process. Sobeys has been great on the bread. We're really working on um, hopefully getting meat from them as well. Again, it's gonna require us expanding our capacity partners and uh, our own capacity, like more freezers and fridges. We will need Starbucks. They were even before this food rescue program really officially started. They were on board, Tim Hortons as well. Tim Hortons' camp this summer was critical and really fed the whole town of Perry Sound for at least two months we did with their food. They donated over 16,000 um, pounds of food that would have gone to campers this summer. And because camp was canceled, uh, Jillian reached out and she just, you know, she, she did it in a few different stages because there's no way we could have rescued it all at first, but uh, she's been an amazing partner in our food rescue program. Um, I have to stop touching her. Uh, Boston Pizza. So some of the restaurants, Boston Pizza, Trestle, Henry's, uh, when they have maybe big events or they have leftover food or Trestle got a, a new chef at one point and they were going with different menu items. So they contact us and let us know the food that they have and can we use it? And then we just coordinate a volunteer to go pick it up. Um, and Northern Swine and Steer, the new restaurant in town, is already on board and donated a bunch of chicken and um, I can't, some other stuff that this past last week. So we're very excited to have them on board. Uh, and you also need food rescue partners in terms of social agencies that you can share food with and can help store food when you get big rescues. So Salvation Army, uh, has we've really enjoyed coming alongside with them, working as a partner. I probably talk to Caroline every day. And it's really, um, our program has helped their program to become more fresh and frozen focused as well. A community living, huge partner. Glenda's amazing. Anytime I have food and I am in a bit of a panic, she's always jumps up and says, I have freezers here. I have, I know of people who could use this. So that's been really fantastic. Uh, we support a spree place, 
with food, the Friendship Center, Brit Community Church. We just started a relationship with them. It's helping us to serve the Brit community um, through their agency. The Mary Street Center and Harvest Church and the Meeting House have been putting on meals throughout the pandemic. And pretty, I would say we have been providing the majority of their protein source and uh, breads and desserts that uh, for the entire pandemic. And that's a really exciting thing for us. Uh, through the pandemic, we supported community programs with over 11,000 pounds of food. So here's uh, just some pictures of our community partners. So these are the lovely ladies of Starbucks. And this was one rescue from Sobeys, just to give you an idea of what we get. Um, you know, this is all food that would have been thrown out. And it was all, this was an amazing rescue. It was really just all food that we were able to share on a Tuesday. Um, this is pre-pandemic. And so we tried to rescue everything Tuesday morning because we had food bank Tuesday morning. Now we have food bank every day. So we do rescues more frequently. Um, but yeah, I, it's just amazing when you look at this food and you think that this would have gone in the garbage. This is an example of one food rescue done at No Frills. And uh, that's all meat. Like probably 14 boxes of banana boxes of meat. And I think that weighs, because I've done it before, about 560 pounds. And that's all meat for the community. So it's pretty exciting. And that's Laura. She's wonderful. We dislike when she goes on vacation because nobody does it like her. Um, this was our first rescue from Tim Horton's camp when they had uh, they had originally scheduled a March break camp and that was canceled. And so Jillian gave me a call and we got all of this fresh produce yogurt, which all went to community members who were just starting to isolate at that time. So it couldn't have arrived at a better time. Um, and for a lot of these organizations, if they are donating food waste, we can, um, if they provide us with invoices, then we can provide them with a charitable tax receipt for food that they purchased but weren't able to use, but then chose to donate as well. So getting businesses on board, this was one of the challenges at first. I remember approaching Sobeys about two years ago, um, and they just didn't want to get involved because of the liability. So. Uh, we let them know that in Canada and all the provinces, there is protection through the Food Donation Act. And to encourage people to become food donors, it's very easy to let them know the financial and corporate returns because it's pretty much a 13,000% or 1,300% overall return on investment. And we really know that, like Laura, like at No Frills, super excited. All the girls in the bakery at Sobeys, same thing, are always on board with uh, getting excited to see us, letting people know that that's what they're doing in their community. Tipping fees um, are gate fees that people, that agencies or organizations have to pay for dumping food in the landfill. And um, it definitely is a huge PR because I know many people in our community will shop at places which are food rescue friendly and we give them a little sticker to let them let other people know that it's a part of what they do and then quickly we just provide organizations and consumers with this handy little chart which lets them know how much longer they can keep products if they store them at the right temperature in the right places. There's really only five foods in Canada which have expiry dates and that's baby food, meal replacements, nutritional supplements, and like usually it's prescription, uh, ensure, things like that. But all other food can be consumed past best before date if it's stored properly. And this is another uh, guide through Food Banks Canada template that we have um, that we eagerly share with our because at first when we were handing out some of this um, 
meet, people were saying, oh, it's expired. And so we provided this to individuals who had a lack of knowledge on things so that we could let them know that this food was perfectly safe to consume. And uh, really it was only when we first started the prog program that we had any issues with this. And now people are always so excited and even requesting, you know, lamb, which we get on a regular basis. Um, so it's also important to provide your donors and uh, with the information that all the volunteers understand the safe food requirements, that we are a legit organization, that we train our volunteers in safe food handling, and that we are regularly inspected by public health. Um, just so that they feel safe in knowing that we know what to do with their food. And so finally, the good stuff. That was a lot of before stuff, but these are our numbers. So this is just from one year. We started the program last September. And so the value of food we rescued in one year was 147,000 or 537. And that's based on, based on an industry standard of $2 and $2.60 per pound of food donated. Um, 56,745 meals we rescued, and that's based on, um, they use the equivalent of one pound of food equals one meal. And the one that I know Ben gets so excited about is the kilograms of greenhouse gases that were averted, and that we are pretty excited and surprised by that number. And how that's calculated is when we receive a rescue, um, I have to enter in what was meat, what was product, produce, what was baked goods, and they have a formula in there to calculate the appropriate amount of greenhouse gases. And if you look at the food categories we've rescued, the uh, dark brown area is meat, this is dairy and produce is green and that green is an area we're working on and trying to figure out how we can do better in that. And if you can see right here, there is uh, the, that during the pandemic, our numbers went way up because we really were rescuing food from almost every restaurant in Perry Sound. So this was something I kind of already mentioned that during the pandemic, we were able to support most of the meal programs here in town and that over since April 1st, which, you know, was only a few months ago, we supported the community with 11,352 pounds of food. The future of food rescue. So we currently have a grant into the Ministry of Environment and we are very hopeful and feeling positive that uh, we'll be getting a refrigerated cargo van and this would really increase our ability to rescue from further distances away. I know Port Carling uh, Foodland has reached out to us, um, MacTier, and so it's exciting that we're going to get more uh, grocery stores on board and then also be able to transport this food to other food banks like South River and Powassan who then could share it with their community members as well. And the other thing we're still continuing to work on is to reduce the stigma of accessing a food bank by framing it like they're helping us move our food and they're helping the environment at the same time. Some simple ways for people to reduce food waste is get creative with your leftovers. Same thing we kind of do if it's food that maybe we couldn't share, we might make it into a community meal. Our community meals have been shut down right now, but when they start up again, we will definitely be using rescued food to produce them. Um, also, when you go out to eat, maybe just be a little bit more mindful of how much you order and if it's actually necessary and uh, take to go food in because restaurants will just dispose of it all and maybe learn how to dehydrate foods at home donate any extra foods we do a big uh, a big push at the end of labor day for all cottagers or people who might be shutting down their places to donate food that perhaps they would feel would be expired um 
before the next time they come up to their place. So we get a huge amount of donations with people shutting down their cottages and to consider composting. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you, Clarissa. And uh, thank you for sharing everything about the food rescue program. I think even just looking at the numbers alone, it's a testament to the work that you're doing within the community and, and all the hard work that you've done. Um, and I'd like to thank as well, Glenda and Clarissa now for, for both joining us today. Um, again, you're doing amazing things in the community from both the food security and climate change perspective, um, as well as from many other perspectives too. I'll mention again that this webinar has been recorded and it will be made available on the Georgian Bay Biosphere's YouTube channel shortly. So if you'd like to review anything that our amazing presenters shared today, uh, you will be able to watch it again there. Um, and we will share some of these resources that our presenters have shared as well, such as the, um, the best before and an expiry date chart that uh, Clarissa mentioned as well as the um, starting a community garden resource that uh, Glenda had shared. Um, but with that, thank you all for joining us today for this community gardens and food waste webinar. Have a great day, everyone.